Okay, welcome back. This is carrying on with the introduction, chapter one of fluid mechanics. In this presentation, I'm going to be going over some, again, more of the basic concepts of fluid mechanics. I'll start by talking about the velocity vector field and a really important concept called the no slip condition. We'll talk about fluid properties something called Newton's Law of Viscosity, which we're going to apply over and over again in this course, and then kind of an exception to Newton's Law of uh, Viscosity called something called non-Newtonian fluids. So at the end, I'll, I'll talk about two different types of flow, uh, laminar and turbulent flow, and how these are uh, determined by something called the Reynolds number. Okay, we're going to be using in some parts of this course, especially chapter four, we're going to be describing the velocity field in a fluid as a vector field. So if you remember from your the work you've done previously in vectors, you have in the X, Y, and Z coordinates, we have unit vectors, I in the X, J in the Y, K in the Z direction. And then we represent here, this is the velocity vector, the local velocity vector at some x, y, z point in the fluid. And it's composed of three components. It has an x component, a y component, and a z component. The x component in fluid mechanics is always, it's sort of a standard, it's denoted u. The y component of velocity is denoted lowercase v, and the z component is denoted lowercase w. So you can represent the velocity vector. Here I've showed anything that's bolded is a vector. You can represent it as the x component of velocity, which is u in the i direction. And it could vary. u could vary spatially in three coordinates in time, v in the j hat direction, and w in the k hat direction. Where uh, uv and w, or those three velocity components, they vary in the three coordinate directions, and they could also, in theory, at least in, in some flows, vary with time. If the flow varies with time, we say that the flow is transient or unsteady. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is really important, because this is going to come up over and over and over again, all the way, probably till the last... Uh, lecture in fluid mechanics. It's called the no-slip condition. It's, as I say, it's one of the most important concepts possibly in fluid mechanics. The no-slip condition refers to the fact that at a solid surface, the fluid sticks to the surface. It adheres to the surface. So it's an experimentally observed fact that if you have flow over a surface, the fluid has the same velocity as the surface right at the surface. Here I've got a, a famous image taken from the album of fluid motion. And okay, let's orient ourselves. So here's a solid surface here. This is the x direction and the, it has the u component of velocity in the x direction. This is the y direction, which would have the v component of velocity. And in this famous experiment, water was flowing from left to right at nine millimeters per second. And then there's this little fine wire here and they, in the experiment at time zero, they turned on that wire and it caused a, a chemical reaction. A little cloud of particles was shed by the wire. And so what you're seeing here is the edge of that cloud of particles uh, that are being cast off the wire. So if the flow is going at nine millimeters per second and they took this shot one second uh, after the electricity being turned on the wire, this distance from here to here would be nine millimeters. And so what you're seeing really is a sort of a, a visualization of the local velocity and how it varies in the y direction. So we could show the u component of velocity as such. So we have, this would be going at a full nine millimeters a second out here, and it goes slower and slower and slower as you come down. This is the U component of velocity. And then at the surface, you can see that the velocity goes to zero. And that point, it goes to zero there because of what's called the no-slip condition. So 
if the surface is stationary, if that wall is stationary, then we, we know that u is zero at y equals zero. y equals zero corresponds to the wall location. And so at a solid stationary surface, we can set both the u and v components to zero. Now the u component here is zero because of the no slip condition, because the fluid sticks at the surface. The v component is because the surface is solid and impermeable. You know, there, if, it, it's, if it was a porous surface, like a sponge, and you were blowing uh, water out through the sponge, then V could possibly not be zero. But because it's a solid impermeable surface, V is zero. So U equals zero is the no-slip condition, and V equals zero is the impermeability condition. These two conditions are really important uh, from a mathematical perspective, because they set the boundary condition for our differential equations at the surface. And so, yeah, what I just said, the no-slip condition provides the boundary condition for mathematical solutions to fluid flow. And we're going to talk about those in Chapter 4 when we get to the fluid dynamics part of the course. So what's being shown here is two solid walls, two fixed solid walls, and there's a pressure gradient, so a pump is driving a flow, and in laminar flow, I'll talk about what laminar flow is in a, in a few moments, and later in this presentation, you get a parabolic flow, but at the wall, the fluid that's flowing between those parallel plates sticks at the wall, and you get u equals zero. This, by the way, is called Poiset flow, uh, after an early uh, fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics researcher. Another example that we're going to look at in Chapter 4 is something called Couet flow. Couet flow is where we have a fixed wall on one side, and on the other side we have a moving wall. So this would be like a plate moving at some velocity v. And there's no pump driving the flow, it's just the viscous drag of this surface driving the flow. And we can show, and we will show in Chapter 4, that you get a linear velocity profile. And the boundary conditions here are this wall is fixed, so the velocity is zero at y equals zero. y is the coordinate normal to the surface. And when we get to y equals h, when we get all the way up to this surface, the fluid sticks to this plate, and it, the, the boundary condition is that the x component of velocity equals whatever the velocity of that plate is. And so you can see how the no-slip condition provides the boundary conditions for the velocity profiles. That will become very important in Chapter 4. Now, just to help you sort of remember the no-slip condition, there's some everyday consequences to the no-slip condition that you've probably noticed but not really thought of. If you've ever tried to get the last little bit of ketchup out of the bottle, the ketchup is a very viscous fluid. We haven't talked about viscosity yet, but it has a high resistance to shear, and it sticks at the surface, and you'd have to wait for, well, a very long time for that to come out, because right at the surface, the ketchup is stuck to the bottle. Another everyday example is, you know, if you look at the dust on the on a car hood, you know, even though the car maybe drove down the highway at, uh, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, the dust particles don't get blown off. That's because the dust particles are sitting right at the surface and the velocity at the surface is zero. So it's the dust particles, the fine dust particles are sitting in a very low velocity region. So here's a little video there. Just there's water flow in this case, from right to left, you can see the flow. And what's happened here is a little bit of dye has been injected at the wall. And you can see how even though the flow is continuing downstream, the uh, dye at the wall is stuck there, and you can actually have to brush it off. Uh, so that's a really nice demonstration of the no-slip condition. Okay, next we're going to talk about fluid properties. Some of these are pretty straightforward. You've seen them before. Density is pretty obvious. It's mass per unit volume and kilograms per cubic meter in the metric system and in the British gravitational system, slugs per cubic foot. Remember, slug is the unit of mass in the British gravitational system. Key point is that liquids, uh, at least at normal pressures that you would encounter in most engineering applications, liquids can be considered incompressible. And that means that their density doesn't depend on pressure. So if you look at table A1 in your book, 
the density of wa liquid water as a function of temperature, it, it, you really don't need to specify the pressure. This is any pressure near atmospheric pressure or an own way above atmospheric pressure. It's almost incompressible. But you'll notice the density does vary. It does decrease with temperature, and that's because of thermal expansion. So liquids are incompressible, which means their density is not a function of pressure. That's a key point. Gases, on the other hand, if you increase the pressure, their density will increase. And the density of gases can be calculated using the ideal gas equation of state. Now, if you've taken thermodynamics, you should know or you may recall that the ideal gas equation of state is an approximation. It's a really good approximation, provided your, your temperatures that are above the critical point. Remember your TS diagram in thermodynamics. So if you're above the critical temperature and you're below the critical pressure, uh, you're well above it, then you can then the ideal gas equation of state is a really good approximation. And you can write that here. This is written not using the universal gas constant, but using the specific gas constant. So density is absolute pressure. R is the gas constant and T is the absolute temperature. And you can look up for air. The gas constant is 287 joules per kilogram K. So how you'd use that, for example, if you were trying to calculate the density of, of air at room conditions, which we know is of order of a, a kilogram per cubic meter, you probably should have that number sort of in your head. So atmosphere around 100 kPa at 20 degrees C. So we put in the pressure here in Pascals, Newtons per meter squared. There's R for air, 287 joules, which is Newton meters per kilogram K. If you had carbon dioxide or some other gas, you'd go and look up the different R value for uh, that gas in table A4. And then the temperature, don't forget, it has to be an absolute. So here we're dealing in Celsius, so you add 273. And you can calculate that out. Now also, I just really want to emphasize this. Take the time, it's worth it, to check that the unit's balanced. If you've messed up the something, you forgot a term, you'll pick it up. So you can see here, Newtons cancel with Newtons. Kelvin cancels with Kelvin, and you're left with, well, this is going to be kilograms, which is on the bottom of the bottom, so it's going to be on the top. You can see uh, kilograms per cubic meter. So we can check that the units actually balance. That gives us some confidence in our calculation. Okay, we're going to be using specific gravity in this course. Specific gravity is just the ratio of the, of the density of whatever you're interested in, of the liquid to that of water. And it's usually, it's, by standard, it's taken up four degrees C. Now, four degrees C for water is the maximum density point. Water has this unusual property of having a maximum density of four degrees C, which just happens to be a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So if the specific gravity of the, of the liquid is, is less than one, that means it's less dense than water and it floats. And here I've gone to the great expense of putting some olive oil on a glass. So, the specific gravity of olive oil might be 0.9, so it floats on top of uh, on top of water. Another property is specific weight, and it, it's really analogous to density. Density is mass per unit volume. Specific weight is weight per unit volume. So if you just take density and you multiply it by g, you get this gamma. So it has units of newtons per cubic meter or pounds per cubic foot, because here we're talking about the weight per unit volume. So for example, if you look up in your book, water at 20 degrees C has a density of 998 kilograms per cubic meter or 1.937 slugs per cubic foot. So what I've done here is just multiplied rho by G in both sets of units to get the specific weight of water is 9790 newtons per cubic meter. We're going to use that a lot. And when we come to the chapter two, and the specific weight of water in the British gravitational system is 62.3 pounds per cubic feet. Now, it turns out that when we do the hydrostatic portion of the course, the forces in stationary reservoirs, that the hydrostatic pressure distribution, you know, we know that pressure increases as you move 
deeper in water and it goes up linearly. It's just gamma of the fluid times H. So that's where you might see this or you will see this property of specific weight coming in in chapter two. Okay, the next property and probably the most important important one and the one you maybe you haven't learned about yet is viscosity and there's a couple of types of viscosity we're going to mo mostly work with dynamic viscosity it's given the greek uh, lowercase letter mu some books refer to dynamic viscosity as absolute viscosity uh, but i will probably use the term dynamic viscosity it has units of kilograms per meter second or slugs per foot second Okay, so we learned earlier that a fluid is, is a substance that can't resist shear without continuous deformation. Well, viscosity is the fluid's resistance to that flow. It's the resistance to the applied shear stress. So things like honey and engine oil, you know, if you tip a jar of, of, of honey, it will flow out very slowly because it has a lot of resistance to shear stress. If you ever tried to put oil in your car in the winter time, you, you, the engine oil flows very, uh, very slowly. It's quite a viscous fluid, whereas water and air are very low viscosity. Tip a jar of water on a side, it will very quickly spill out. Has a very low resistance to shear. So viscosity is the, if you like, the resistance to flow or the resistance to an applied shear stress. There's another type of viscosity that you'll see occasionally. Uh, that comes up in some, because of the mathematics, is called kinematic viscosity. Kinematic viscosity is just dynamic viscosity divided by density. It has units of meters squared per second or foot squared per second. And it's represented in pretty much every fluid mechanics textbook by the lower case Greek letter nu. So you might see that occasionally. Most of the time we'll be dealing in dynamic viscosity, mu. Okay, a little bit of the mathematics of viscosity. For most fluids, and in this course we're going to assume all the fluids behave this way, the shear stress in the fluid is linearly proportional to the rate of uh, shear strain in the fluid element. So it's really about the stress-strain relationship. And so if we consider a, a little differential element of fluid here, and it's not moving on the bottom and it's moving at the top at velocity du, the rate at which this sort of square is turning into a rectangle is the rate of, of shear strain. So how rapidly this angle uh, d theta is changing with time is the rate of shear strain. And you can very easily show that the rate of change of that angle is just equal to the local velocity gradient in the, in the fluid. How rapidly the x component of velocity is changing in the y direction. Now, how can you see that? Well, if this, imagine which, this is fixed down here. We have a plate moving here at velocity u. Well, in, a, in time, in a little increment of time, Velocity times time is distance. So that's how far the plate will move in time dt. And we can relate, this is like an arc length, right? So this arc length here equals dy d theta using the arc length formula. So dy d theta equals this arc length du dt. And that, if you rearrange it, gives that the rate of change of the angle is just equal to the velocity gradient in the fluid. Now, for most fluids, they're called Newtonian fluids, we'll get to this, there's a linear relationship between the shear stress in the fluid and this local velocity gradient. So here I've shown the, the here's the velocity gradient, right? dy, du, where we have the no-slip condition and the velocity increasing as you move away from the surface. So the shear stress on a fluid element depends upon the, the local velocity gradient multiplied by uh, what we're going to call viscosity. Most fluids have a linear relationship. Air, water, oil, almost everything you're going to deal with in your professional career. There are some exceptions. I'll talk about that later. But in this course, we're only going to deal with fluids that have a linear relationship between the shear stress and the velocity gradient.
So if you have a linear relationship between shear stress and velocity gradient, there's a constant of proportionality here, and that constant of proportionality is the dynamic viscosity mu. So over here we have shear stress in pascals, newtons per meter squared, and this is our dynamic viscosity, and this is the local velocity gradient. So how many meters per second per meter of distance, which has units of one over second. This equation is sometimes called Newton's law of viscosity. And so you can see uh, the constant proportionality here is, is dynamic viscosity. And I've shown you here, I don't know which table this is. This is taken from your book. This is some selected fluids at 20 degrees C. And you can see the dynamic viscosity, the resistance to shear of different fluids varies tremendously. You know, something thick like glycerin or oil, engine oil is very, very thick, all the way up to something that's, you know, water is about three orders of magnitude less, and air is even lower viscosity than, uh, than water. So it shears and has a resistance to flow that is very low. I mentioned that for most real fluids, for most fluids you're going to deal with in your career, the relationship between the graph here is shear stress versus the velocity gradient or the rate of shear strain. And, you know, if you look at most fluids, they have a linear relationship, air, water, water at a different temperature, crude oil, almost any fluid you would pick you would have a straight line, and the slope of this line is the dynamic viscosity. Such fluids that obey this law are called Newtonian fluids. And in this course, unless I tell you otherwise, we're going to assume that all the fluids that we're going to deal with are Newtonian. And so you can see that water at 100 degrees C has a lower slope. It's less viscous than water at 60 degrees C. So this is a graph, again, taken from your book. Uh, I wouldn't use the graph for doing problems. The graph is more to illustrate the trend. This is dynamic viscosity. And here we have temperature in degrees C. And you can see that the dynamic viscosity of things like crude oil and kerosene, these are all liquids up here. Liquids, the dynamic viscosity of liquids decreases with temperature. So as you heat them up, they become... Uh, less viscous, they become less resistant to shear, they flow more easily. And you've experienced that yourself. If you've ever taken you know, honey out of the fridge, once you warm it up, it becomes a lot more runny. You know, it becomes less viscous. It flows more easily. So the viscosity of liquids decreases as temperature increases. You probably have some everyday experience with that. I mentioned trying to put engine oil in your car in the wintertime is very difficult. It's super viscous when it's cold. Now, it turns out, and you probably don't have any everyday experience of this, but the viscosity of gases goes the other way. That if we look at down here, we have gases, air, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, helium, and their viscosity or their dynamic viscosity increases slightly with temperature. So that's something to keep in mind. There are some Commercial instruments for measuring dynamic viscosity. I'm showing one here. What's shown in this diagram is called a spindle viscometer. They cost about $5,000, roughly speaking, uh, depending on the how many features you want with them. And what they have is they have a, uh, uh, a spindle here that spins, and you can get different spindles for them. And you place that spindle in a beaker filled with the fluid that you want to measure the viscosity of, and it rotates this spindle at a known RPM, and it measures the torque required to uh, overcome the viscous shear stress, and that is linearly related to uh, uh, the dynamic viscosity. So they can spin this at a known speed and measure the torque, and they can get the dynamic viscosity of the fluids in a matter of seconds. They're used widely in the, uh, the food industry for checking the, well, the consistency of batches and things like that. So these, these meters measure in units that you, you might see in what's called centipois. Uh, 
This is after a quite a famous scientist in the 1800s who studied blood flow. Uh, I already talked about Poiset flow, uh, Jean Poiset, and where one centipois is uh, 10 to the minus 3 of a kilogram per meter second. Yeah, and of course, it comes with different spindles, and the you know you'd use these bigger spindles for less viscous fluids because it would give you more torque, uh, and the, the you know you need a big enough torque signal to measure. I'm hoping to buy one of these for Lab One, so hopefully by the time you see this video, we have one of these that I'll demonstrate in the lab. Okay, let's do a numerical example. This is an example of actually calculating a shear force on a plate. So the problem reads, a plate in a machine is lubricated by a film of SAE 50W, that's Society of Automotive Engineers 50 winter weight oil, at 20 degrees C, and the thickness of the oil layer is one and a half millimeters thick. So here we see the diagram. We've got a plate that's being driven along. There's the little oil layer, one and a half millimeters. The plate has a length of 30 millimeters here, and it has a width into the page of 130 millimeters. And what we want to calculate is the shear force here required to drive this plate at a constant velocity of 2.1 meters per second. So here's our equation, that the shear stress in the fluid equals dynamic viscosity times the velocity gradient how fast the x component of velocity changes in the y direction. And of course, it goes unsaid. From now on, I won't mention it again. We're going to assume that it's a linear relationship there. So viscosity is a constant, and we have engine oil, which is a Newtonian fluid. So how do we get, how do we get the velocity gradient? So let me explain that. Okay, so here's our oil layer here. And what I've done is, zoom, is zoomed in on this little area here. At the surface... At the lower surface, the that surface is, is not moving, it's fixed. So at y equals zero, that's the y coordinate, we have the no-slip condition applying. So u equals zero because of no-slip. And now at the upper surface here, this surface is moving at u equals 2.1 meters per second. The fluid also sticks at that surface. Now, I'm going to assume a linear velocity profile here. For the purpose of chapter one, I would always do that. We will show when we get to chapter two that that is indeed a linear velocity profile. For now, uh, you'll just have to trust me on that. So we have a linear velocity profile. So what we need to calculate du dy, we know dy and we know du. It goes from zero to 2.1 meters per second in a gap of one and a half millimeters. So du dy, since it's, since it's a straight line, is delta u over delta y. Well, it goes from zero to v over one and a half millimeters. And v is 2.1 meters per second. So we have a, a velocity gradient of 1,400 meters per second per meter. So that has units of seconds to the minus one. So now we just got to look up the viscosity of that SAE oil, and we can get the shear stress and multiply it by the plate surface area to get the force. So I've reproduced what we had so far. We have the velocity gradient. Now I'm going to look up in table A3 of your book, the dynamic viscosity at 20 degrees C of SAE 50W oil and it's 0.86 kilogram per meter second. I strongly encourage you to go and check that so that you know where it is when you're doing your quiz or, or the exam. So now we just multiply to get the shear stress. We multiply mu du dy, so 0.86 kilogram per meter second, 1400, uh, one over second. And that works out to be 1,204, and you can see it has units of kilograms, meter per second squared, which looks odd because we're expecting this to be a stress. We're expecting that to be pascals or newtons per meter squared. Well, it's because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And so a kilogram, if we rearrange this, is a, is a let me check, newton second squared per meter. And we substitute into here 
uh, Newton second squared meter, you can see the second squares are going to go away. And what you're going to end up with is Newtons per meter squared, which is a appropriate unit for Pascal. So the, so the units all work out. It's worth doing that just to be sure that you haven't made a mistake. So now we have the, the shear stress at this interface. Now, what's the direction? Pause the video for a second and think about this. What is the direction of the fluid shear stress on the plate? Take a moment to think about that. Okay, the answer. The answer is that viscosity acts like fluid friction. It opposes motion. So the force of the fluid on the plate is opposing the motion. So it's going to be to the left. Okay, so here's the result from uh, the previous screen. We have that the shear stress now is 1,204 newtons per square meter acting to the left. So this is a stress. So we need to multiply by an area to get a force. Now you're told in the problem statement that the length of the plate is 30 millimeters this way, in this direction, and it's 130 millimeters into the page. So the plan area, the area if you view this from the top, is going to be 30 millimeters by 130 millimeters. Of course, putting those into, into uh, meters gives 3.9 times 10 to the minus 3 square meters. So we multiply this area by this stress to get the shear force. So the shear force is the force of the fluid on the bottom of the plate that balances the force that's driving the plate forward. That's the external force. This is the fluid force. Now this plate is traveling at constant velocity, so it's not accelerating. So F equals MA, the sum of the forces equals zero. And that force is just the stress times the surface area that the oil makes contact uh, with the upper plate. And that works out to 4.7 newtons. Okay, I thought I'd spend just a few minutes talking about non-Newtonian fluids. We're, this is probably the only time in this course when we'll talk about this. But I do want to mention that some fluids do not obey Newton's law of viscosity. In other words, they don't have a linear relationship between shear stress and the velocity gradient. And they require, in some cases, much more complicated models. So some fluids have a nonlinear relationship here, and some fluids, the viscosity here changes with time. So viscosity is not a constant. We call these fluids non-Newtonian fluids. And over here is a graph so of shear stress versus this shear rate or uh, velocity gradient. And as we learned earlier, this linear relationship here is what we call the Newtonian fluid. Air, water, oil, glycol, almost any fluid you can name would fall along that curve. But there are some funny fluids that don't obey Newton's law of viscosity. There's some fluids that get more viscous as you shear them, some that get are shear thinning and become less viscous, and then some that exhibit a yield stress. Some examples, and I know we have biomedical engineers in this course, so I mentioned this one specifically, is blood is not typically a Newtonian fluid. It's shear thinning. It's what's called pseudoplastic. So as you shear it at faster rates, its effective viscosity decreases slightly below that of a Newtonian fluid. So if you're doing numerical modeling of blood flow, uh, your numerical model has to account for these non-Newtonian effects. Another example, <laughs> the funny one is ketchup. Ketchup is one of those ones that has a, has a time-dependent viscosity. It's called fixotropic. When a bottle of ketchup has been sitting on the shelf for a long time, it sort of almost sets. It turns into kind of a gel. There's an internal structure that gets formed. And when you first try to make the ketchup flow, it's very viscous. And then eventually, those structures break down, and after it's been sheared for a little while, it flows a lot more easily. So 
Ketchup is thixotropic. Its viscosity or its effective viscosity changes with time. And you've, you've probably all done this. It, the uh, ketchup won't come out. And then all of a sudden it starts to go. And what happens is this viscosity drops away and you get way more ketchup than you wanted. If you're a baker, you've probably noticed that egg whites are, ha, are have a weird behavior. They uh, become more thick. They become more viscous as you whip them. They're they're the opposite. They're called real pectic. Their viscosity increases with time. But almost everything, water, air, engine oil, glycol, etc., the viscosity does not change with time. So there are some funny fluids called non-Newtonian fluids. They're a whole field of fluid mechanics on their own. That field is called rheology, and it's really a graduate level course. Oh, yeah, before we leave this topic, I thought I'd show you this. This is something you can try at home. I really recommend you do. If you've never played with cornstarch and water mixture, uh, you should really give it a try. It's really quite fascinating, its behavior. Here's someone walking on a pool of cornstarch and water. It's like a fluid, but uh, it has some really weird behaviors. I made a little video here. So I would really encourage you to give this a go. This is just cornstarch mixed with water. You can see it's it's really quite runny. Uh, you just adjust the amount of water until you get a mixture that looks a bit like this. And uh, you can see it pours well. It's It pours. But when you try to drive your finger into it, it's like a solid. It locks up. But if you insert your finger slowly its viscosity is very low. So it has a very odd shear rate dependent viscosity or effective viscosity. Okay, from that video that you just saw, what do you think the shear stress velocity gradient curve would look like for cornstarch and water? So if you plotted shear stress here in Pascal's, versus the velocity gradient, how rapidly you were shearing adjacent layers of fluid by one another. What do you think that graph would look like? And if you go back and look at the uh, non-Newtonian curve, which non-Newtonian fluid do you think cornstarch and water is? Take a moment, uh, pause the video, or go back and have a look and think about this. Okay, so I'll give the answer. The answer is that cornstarch and water is what's called dilatant. When you try to shear it, when I try to shear it at low velocities, so when I'm pouring the cornstarch and water out of the beaker and the layers are moving past one another very slowly, so you have low velocity gradients, it's viscosity, it's effective viscosity is very low. Remember, the viscosity is the slope of the uh, shear stress velocity gradient curve. But if I try to drive my finger into the, into the cornstarch and water solution rapidly, in other words, I try to create a very high velocity gradient because my uh, finger is going in fast, it, creates a, uh, it, it has a very high effective viscosity. In fact, it's almost like a solid. So, Cornstarch and water is one of those really unusual fluids, has a very rapidly increasing uh, viscosity with shear rate relationship. It's called dilatant. I really recommend you give this a shot. It's kind of fun. You can buy a package of cornstarch for a couple of bucks uh, at the grocery store, and I, I bet you you'll have uh, find it quite entertaining to play with. Okay, I'm going to end with just a few more sort of important concepts in fluid mechanics. One of those concepts is laminar versus turbulent flow. Let me start this video here. This video is of a jet in water with some dye. You can see the very ordered jet here, and then it breaks up into a very random turbulent flow. In turbulent flow, particles, or there's no such thing as a particle, but a little package of fluids move in very irregular patterns. If you were to imagine that point there, right there at XYZ, if you plotted the velocity at this point here as a function of time, it would vary randomly 
as different vortices and eddies past that point. So turbulent flow has a certain stochastic or random nature. It requires, it requires a statistical analysis. Now, most real flows are turbulent. Most flows you'll encounter in nature are turbulent. And turbulent flow has some really handy uses for engineering, particularly turbulent flows because of all the mixing. They really enhance heat transfer. So if you're trying to cool something by blowing a fluid onto it, which is called convective heat transfer, turbulent flow is desirable. The other thing about turbulent flow is there, at least at the moment, it's one of the great unsolved problems of physics. We have some really good engineering models. We can predict turbulent flow and turbulent heat transfer, but they're all approximate models. We don't have an exact solution to uh, turbulent flow at the present time. So that's turbulent flow. Another type of flow is called laminar flow. Let me start this video. So here we have a, an airfoil inclined relative to a very slow viscous flow going over it. And here we have dye being introduced upstream. And you can see we don't have eddies. We don't have turbulent vortices going past. If you were to plot the velocity at, a, at this point here, if you were to plot the velocity at this point here, the velocity would be constant with time. There'd be no stochastic variation. So in laminar flow, the little particles of fluid, little packets of fluid move along smooth lines, layers. Laminar comes from the word laminae, meaning layers. So in laminar flow, the velocity is constant at a point. And you get laminar flow when you have low fluid velocities, small objects, or highly viscous fluids. And they're relatively uncommon. Most of the time you get turbulent flow. If you have a very viscous fluid, so a fluid with a high dynamic viscosity, that dynamic viscosity resists here and it tends to dampen out the eddies or vortices associated with turbulent flow. This leads nicely into the last little section here. I wanna introduce you to something called the Reynolds number. Osborne Reynolds is arguably the most famous scientist in fluid mechanics. An early researcher in fluid dynamics in the 1800s, he discovered that the character of the flow doesn't depend upon any particular one parameter. It depends upon a ratio of parameters that are dimensionless. It's called the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number, RE, is density, velocity of the flow, Let's say we're considering flow in a pipe, then it would be the diameter of the pipe, the internal diameter of the pipe, over dynamic viscosity. So it doesn't matter what value any of these individual parameters have. If the ratio of these parameters is less than 2,300, you get laminar flow. If the number is substantially greater than 2,300, you get turbulent flow. The Reynolds number determines the character of the flow uh, in, in the pipe. You will learn more about this. Lab number two is about the Reynolds number and laminar and turbulent flow in a pipe. And you may wonder where this result comes from, where Osborne Reynolds number comes from. We will show in chapter five in the dimensional analysis section uh, how the Reynolds number comes about. So that's probably the most important single parameter in fluid mechanics is the Reynolds number. You're going to see it a lot in this course. Okay, I'm pretty much done this, this presentation. I just want to alert you that there's a couple of ex an other numerical example videos. So there's an example of calculating the dynamic viscosity of a fluid. This is based on lab number one, where we drop spheres, plastic spheres in oil, and we measure their terminal velocity. So they eventually fall at a, at a speed where their weight equals their drag. And by measuring the their the rate at which these spheres fall in oil, we can determine the viscosity of oil. This is an example of laminar flow. And for very slow flow called Stokes flow, there's an exact solution to this problem. And you're going to be using it in uh, lab number one. The video example is about confirming the dimensional consistency. So showing that the dimensions of uh, 
dynamic viscosity are the same as the dimensions of the uh, right-hand side of this equation. So have a, have a watch of that solution video. There's another video solution. This one is of calculating the viscous shear stress in a boundary layer. We've talked about Newton's law of viscosity in this presentation, that tau equals mu du dy. So you're given, a, in this problem, you're given a, an analytical expression for the velocity profile, and you're asked to calculate, among other things, the, the shear force on the surface. So if wind blows over, for example, water, it drags the water along with it. And we want to calculate what the shear force pushing the surface uh, to the right is. And so have a watch of that video solution. It's an example of applying Newton's law of viscosity to calculate shear force. And it's a slightly more advanced one than we did in this presentation. And that completes this presentation. Bye for now.